Dear Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Thank you for attending the sixth edition of the China Economic Outlook webinar organized by Singapore Business Federation. I'm Flora from the Events and Partnerships Department. I'll be the MC today. We are very happy to share with you that at this afternoon's CEO webinar, we have with us close to 600 participants from not only Singapore and China, but also many other countries from around the world, like Australia, Vietnam, India, Mexico, Pakistan, Germany, etc. Our heartiest welcome to all of you. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions to raise, you may post them using Zoom's Q&A function at any time during the webinar. Our speakers may choose to reply to you during the Q&A session or answer you separately after the webinar. We also hope that you will take part in the poll, which is already live now. This will help us understand your organization's digital adoption journey and your views on the digital economy better. We'll close the poll at 3.30 p.m. and share the results right before the panel discussion begins. Last but not least, we would like to thank Convera, the world's largest non-bank B2B cross-border payments company for sponsoring the event, as well as contributing to the content development along the way. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce to you Mr. Boris Kovacevic, Global Macro Strategist at Convera, who will share his insights on APEC currency chain from the regional perspectives. Hi, Boris. Over to you, please. Well, thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Flora and to segue into this part of the presentation. And of course, a warm welcome to everyone um, listening and joining to this webinar as well from my side. I'm very happy again to be able to join the other speakers today in our attempt to not only explain, but also give an outlook on China and the Chinese economy in particular, and more broadly, the APEC region and its currencies. My part um, on the next slide, if we switch already to the agenda, um, you can clearly see that my part will be heavily centered around explaining the recent development of the APEC currencies and its financial markets, but also explain how and why Chinese and US policy has shaped the broader APEC region. I will then conclude my presentation with forecasts of some selected currencies, currencies of ours, and we'll then hand over to my colleagues, which will talk more about China and its digital development. I will not be on camera for the duration of my presentation, given that is, uh, the slide deck is a bit more technical, so we can focus our sole attention to the upcoming presentation. So if we already switch to the first slide of my presentation, in the beginning, um, most of our macro and FX presentations we give to clients and on, on webinars always begin with asking the question why the particular topic we are presenting is important to our audience and to our clients. And of course, with the APEC region, it matters for people and businesses living and operating in Asia. But in this slide, um, the, the previous slide, please, in, in this slide particular, we can see that Asia doesn't only matter for people and businesses living and operating in Asia. APEC, the APEC region has become um, a really important driver of the global economy, and it has been a uh, part of the global financial system. And APEC in particular, this is what we can see on the first slide on the left-hand side. APEC, especially in the decade after the global financial crisis that began in 2007, 08, established itself really as the primary driver of global economic growth. And this development, in my opinion, is heavily reflected in the usage of Asian currencies globally. If we turn our attention to the second chart on the right, we can see that um, while the US dollar and the euro still to this day dominate the global FX landscape in terms of daily spot trading and, and options trading, we see some really interesting developments. Firstly, the Chinese yuan, for example, has moved up to the fifth most traded currency in the world. And secondly, is alongside the Japanese yen, 
the Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australian dollar, um, we have five APEC currencies in the top 10 most traded currencies in the world. But what is as well most important to our clients is not really the strength of a particular region or the usage of a particular currency. What they think about is how strong is a particular currency. And as we will see on the next slide, um, it really becomes clear that economic strength and these higher global trading volumes of a currency do not equate to a stronger currency per se. And the chart on the left-hand side here is probably the most important chart I will show you today in my part of the presentation, because it highlights a couple of really interesting points on how to think about currency markets today. First, um, what we see is that currencies are extremely correlated to each other and that they move in particular phases. So in this chart, in particular, we can see the US dollar index in green, which basically just shows us the strength of the US dollar over the last 30 years. And in blue, or in uh, here in blue, yes, we can see the US dollar index, but not against all major currencies, but only against particular APEC currencies. This is our own index that we have created. And what you can clearly see is that the US dollar has pretty much been in an uptrend ever since the end of the global financial crisis, um, meaning we have had a period, this is the fourth and the fifth period in this chart, a period of 12 years where the US dollar has been appreciating against most currencies, but in particular against the APEC currencies. And on the right chart, we can also see that the US dollar has on average over the period of the last 12 years, um, appreciated around 28% against the basket of nine Asian currencies that I've used in my analysis here. However, um, it is still important to note that there are some benefits um, looking at the APEC region, the Asian region as one single entity, like in this case, for example, where we try to showcase the dollar strength against APEC currencies. But as we will see on the next slide, there are vast regional differences between the currencies. So it, sometimes it doesn't make sense to look at APEC at one, as, as one region. So in the left-hand side, um, these are all the currencies that um, make up our APEC FX currency basket. As you can clearly see here, there are vast differences. On the left-hand side, for example, we see that most of our appreciation of the dollar uh, against these APEC currencies comes from the dollar appreciating by 78% and 62% against the Indian and the Indonesian rupee. The Australian dollar and the Japanese yen have lost quite some value against the US dollar as well, but not as much as these two former currencies. On the other side of the spectrum of the chart, we can see that the, that the Hong Kong dollar and the Singapore dollar have pretty much retained their value against the US dollar over the last 13 years. And because dollar Sing has virtually stayed the same, both currencies, this is what we can see on the right hand side, both currencies, the Singapore dollar and the US dollar, have appreciated against the Chinese one. Um, so the right-hand side basically just tells us the development of the US dollar against the Chinese renminbi in blue and the development of the Singapore dollar against the Chinese renminbi in green. And you can clearly see both have appreciated, especially since the beginning of last year. And dollar renminbi is at its highest since well, 15 years since the global financial crisis, and Singapore dollar versus the Chinese renminbi is near an all-time high. So now that we know that the US dollar, again, is at its highest against the basket of APEC currencies in 30 years, but that there are regional differences that we have to take into account, we can now start asking the question of what has been driving this dollar strength. And on the next slide, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Because again, given the time constraints, if I would have to boil down FX markets or drivers of FX markets into one particular topic or principle, it would be that currencies are primarily driven by changes in interest rates. And on average, this is what we can see on the left hand side, US interest rates have been moving higher more quickly than interest rates in Asia over the last 12 years. In the left chart here, we can see that, again, the US dollar index in green, um, and in blue, the difference in interest rates between the US and those APEC central banks. And we clearly see that 
this continuous rise in the blue line, meaning uh, the rise in U.S. interest rates versus the APEC interest rates, has clearly tracked depreciation of the U.S. dollar quite well. So for us, it is a clear case to say that given that U.S. rates have been moving faster, this is one reason why the U.S. dollar has been appreciating over the last 12 years. And to make it even less complicated, I've created the chart on the right-hand side, which doesn't look at all the APEC central banks, but only at two Asian central banks and the US. So on this chart, we can see the interest rate development of these central banks um, since, the, um, since 2000. And we can see that interest rates in the US and Singapore have pretty much moved in tandem over the 21st century. The Singaporean central bank has always been keen to establish this um, uh, stability in interest rates compared to the US. But in China, it's a completely different story. So the Chinese central bank, the PBOC, has been easing policy, not aggressively, but has steadily easing, been easing policy since the beginning of the 2000s. And this is why for the first time uh, in 24 years, last year, interest rates in Singapore were higher than in China. And the same goes for the US. And because interest rates have been rising in Singapore and in the US compared to falling interest rates in China, as you can see here, this I think ex explains the reasoning of why the Singapore dollar and the US dollar have been so strong against the Chinese renminbi in recent years. So again, um, interest rates in Singapore moving above Chinese interest rates for the first time in 24 years is quite exceptional um, because China was always known as a high yielding currency. Investing in the Chinese renminbi was always seen as getting yield for the investor, which is currently not the case because most other currencies give you more yield than the Chinese renminbi. And because of how exceptional the past few years have been in terms of these historic events happening, uh, we can see that our thesis for FX markets in the next couple of years is that we will start to see some kind of normalization or an unwinding of these extreme positionings to play out in 2024. So if we quickly jump to our first slide in our FX outlook section. Exactly this one. We can see again kind of what, what I mean with this unwinding of these extreme positionings. So before we go into our FX forecast, it is really important again to understand the general intuition behind our reasoning uh, and why we expect the US dollar to weaken. So firstly, because the rate differential, as I have mentioned, between the US and China and between Singapore and China have been already or are at extremely stretched positions compared to historic levels, um, that is something we can, uh, let's see. Uh, this is not the, the right slide. I think we should go to the, let's see, again. It's with the FX outlook and the first slide on the FX outlook. No. That's the one, exactly. So on the, on the left-hand side, we can see that this, um, what we can see here is we're not looking at the US dollar in terms of um, an index versus other uh, currencies. We're looking at specifically the US dollar one currency pair in blue. And we can look at the interest rate differential between the US and China. And first of all, it um, strengthens our thesis that again, currencies are driven by interest rates, but it also tells us that interest rates in the US have been the highest compared to China since the global financial crisis. And this is one reason why the one has depreciated against the US dollar. But again, for us, this is already a really extremely stretched positions. And this is the first case why we're expecting some kind of weakening of the US dollar. But the second for me, most important thing in terms of thinking about why we are expecting the US dollar to weaken is the second chart. Because I've said that the years after the pandemic have been quite exceptional. And this is something that we can see in this chart because especially after 2022, the global economy has been basically driven by two specific things. Firstly, a really globally strong consumer that is backed by a resilient labor market low unemployment rates, and really strong fiscal stimulus from all the governments around the world. On the other side, we had a really weak manufacturing sector that has been pushed down by these global interest rates. And given that, this is what we see on this chart, given that the US is such 
uh, is, is mainly driven by consumption and the consumer and China being driven mainly by investments and manufacturing. This period of a strong consumer and weak manufacturing after COVID has been the worst environment for China, but the best for the US. And this also explains why the US dollar Chinese renminbi um, currency pair has been on such a strong upward trajectory. And again, both of these, we think that they will start normalizing in 2024 as the global consumer starts to weaken and as manufacturing is bottoming and starts recovering in the next year. So if we go particularly to the next slide, where we start talking not broadly about the narrative of a weaker US dollar, but specifically about this currency pair, meaning the US dollar Chinese renminbi, again, we can see that in our central forecast, it assumes a weakening of the currency pair, given that we expect the Chinese um, government to come out with some measured but targeted fiscal stimulus packages, which allows the Chinese central bank not to ease policy too much. And this would result in a weakening um, interest rate differential. So it will close down the gap between China and the US. And this would mean that the currency pair is appreciating. However, as with every other FX forecast that we have, we imagine both up and downside risks. So an upside risk would be, again, inflation staying much higher than expected in the US and the consumer staying resilient because of low unemployment rates. And this would push the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, to hike interest rates one more time. And this would be really bad for not only the global economy, but also risk assets like the Chinese one. On the other side, um, a downside risk would be, again, that inflation falls much quicker in the US, the Fed has to cut rates three or four times next year, and the global economy recovers more than expected. And this was, would push us much lower than our central forecast is expecting. On well, the next slide, just quickly, because I'm running out of time, we can see the same applies because we are thinking about global narratives of a weaker dollar. The same applies for pretty much every currency pair somehow or it under. So with the dollar, uh, dollar sing um, on this slide, some of the same arguments hold it true. However, here we think that um, looking at our fair value model of the currency pair, more appreciation beyond the short term is definitely in store. So interest rates won't be the primary driver on this particular currency pair, given that I've explained that both the Singaporean and the US Central Bank move in tandem in terms of creating or setting monetary policy. But given the continued foreign capital inflows into Singapore and the huge current account surplus, this is something that is driving our fair value of the currency pair down over the next three to five years. And the last currency pair that we have is the Australian dollar. Um, there on the next slide, yes. So here the same applies with the Chinese renminbi because these two currency pairs are highly codependent and the Aussie dollar gets its momentum or its, its impulses from the global economy, from risk assets, and what is happening in China. So if China outperforms next year, the Aussie dollar will rise. If China disappoints the consensus, then the Aussie dollar tends to weaken. And given that we expect a rebound in China next year, and we expect the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates, we do expect some kind of recovery of the Aussie dollar over the next 12 months. So just to summarize, and to give time to the other speakers. Again, Asia's growth contribution to the global economy has definitely increased significantly over the past few decades. However, as we have shown, most currencies have de depreciated against the US dollar, which has been on an upward trend since 2011. Rate differentials do explain most of the move higher, but on average, uh, we expect rate differentials to close down back in 2024, explaining our call for a slightly weaker dollar. And the one, again, should recover some ground under the assumption, and that is important, under the assumption that the manufacturing sector ticks up again and the US Central Bank cuts rates in the second half of next year. Thank you very much. I'm out of time, and I'm looking forward to the other contributions. Thank you, Boris, for the insightful sharing. Uh, we believe a good understanding of the intricacies of uh, key APEC currencies is vital for our businesses to cope with FX market volatility, especially during the internationalization journey. Really appreciate your sharing just now. A gentle reminder to all the participants, if you have questions related to Boris' presentation just now, please feel free to raise them up in the Q&A panel. Now, next, 
please allow me to invite Mr. Wing Chu, Principal, Principal Economist, Greater China Research Team from the Hong Kong Trade and Development Council to share his views on China's economy outlook and the evolution of its digital landscape. Mr. Chu, over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly, uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to the uh, Federation to let me to have an uh, opportunity to talk to you. Well, and I'm going to share with you today about, uh, firstly, the uh, recent uh, Chinese uh, economy outlook. And then I will go through down to the uh, current situation of the digital China um, uh, situation. And then, uh, and lastly, I'm actually more interested to talk with you or uh, share with you about uh, the, uh, my view on the implication on the business. Uh, please. And right now, well, uh, if we look at the Chinese economy, everybody know, well, uh, uh, since the beginning of the year, well, uh, the COVID-19 effects has already gone. Well, and uh, the economy is right now on the track to be back to normal. Uh, in the first half of uh, this year, well, uh, the Chinese economy uh, recorded around 5.5% uh, growth in terms of the GDP. Well, uh, if you compare with uh, the uh, previous years that record a uh, uh, double digit growth or even a high single digit growth uh, 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 period, well, of course, well, uh, right now 5.5 or the, the level around 5 is uh, really uh, relatively uh, slow. But uh, I think in the longer term, well, uh, for the Chinese uh, economic development, well, it will be a, a, a much sustained uh, pace of development. But in view, despite of uh, such a, a, a relative uh, normal uh, development, well, uh, challenges to the economy or uh, even to the uh, individual enterprise remain. Well, uh, early in this uh, this year, well, uh, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council conduct uh, uh, some surveys in the Greater Bay Area in Guangdong Province, as well as the uh, Yangtze River Delta region, uh, including Shanghai. Well, uh, we found that about uh, 90 percent of the survey the company who engaged in uh, uh, international trade or business or even uh, overseas investment, well, uh, the majority say, well, they are right now facing different kind of challenges. Among such uh, companies, well, uh, the first one they pinpoint is about the slow uh, global economy. And it really hurt up uh, their external business. And another one, well, surprisingly, is, uh, are still the COVID effects. Well, most of them say, well, uh, the COVID effects on the supply chains right now still have the, an impact on their uh, external business. Of course, the geopolitical conflicts uh, still carry on. And, uh, the, another one is about the financial cost. Well, uh, as all we know, well, uh, interest rate hikes uh, uh, around the world uh, is, uh, is still present here. Well, and, um, and for those engaged in external trade or investment, they are, their business are right now still affected by the high financial cost at this moment. Next slide, please. Well, uh, there's some uh, figures uh, uh, that the grant, uh, grants on the, uh, the uh, different kind of uh, uh, economic uh, indicators. Well, uh, for the industrial production, well, uh, it's very well, well, uh, a few percentage uh, grow uh, in uh, uh, the last few months. And CPI for the CPI, well, uh, is a struggle around the level of zero. Uh, and uh, for the, uh, uh, last couple of months, well, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, positive or negative uh, CPI, right? But uh, I would like to draw your attention to the manufacturing sector, right? If uh, we look at the PMI, uh, for the uh, last few months, well, uh, the index uh, actually are below uh, the, uh, uh, the average 50% uh, 50, uh, percent, uh, 50 uh, uh, level. Well, it's still uh, on the contraction side. But we can see that for the development trend is right now going upwards a little bit uh, and uh, approaching to the uh, 50 percent after the 50 index level. Uh, and for the and uh, for the external environment, 
Well, uh, I think uh, it's uh, really uh, still uh, among the concern because uh, of the uh, global demand is quite uninspiring. Uh, in, for the first uh, eight months of the uh, of this year, although according to the China statistics out there, um, um, the Chinese government say well uh, for the external trade, well uh, in terms of the RMB, well the growth is around zero. Well, but if we look at uh, the external trade in US dollar terms, actually it declines a bit. Well, uh, from Hong Kong's point of view, actually we, uh, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the US dollar. So we look at the US dollar more and uh, it really the, uh, the uh, weaker external performance uh, caused by the uh, weak global demand actually uh, affect, uh, have a much uh, impact on the external sector of the China's economy. In view of this one, well, uh, this government in mainland China, including the central government, as well as the local provincial governments, have already rolled out a number of uh, measures that are trying to stimulate, put, uh, inject some stimulants uh, into the economy. Next slide, please. Well, from the monetary policy uh, uh, viewpoint, well, uh, of uh, us know that, well, uh, interest rate reductions, and uh, the reason, uh, including the recent reserve rate uh, ratio cut, well, uh, for the RMB deposit. Well, uh, for such kind of a uh, uh, reduction in the ratio or the induction, uh, some interest rate, well, uh, the government is trying to inject uh, some additional liquidity into the economy. But I think, well, uh, unlike the uh, uh, years before, well, uh, the government in, uh, maybe inject a, a large amount of money into the market, well, uh, Today, well, uh, the uh, China government, actually, especially the uh, BBOC, the BBOC Bank of China, uh, relatively, I think, well, uh, the bank is uh, relatively uh, cautious about uh, injecting too much money into the, uh, into the economy. Uh, well, uh, because, well, uh, if they do it, they're trying to do it, well, uh, it could, may cause a lot of trouble in the long term. So, well, so I think, well, uh, the China government today is, uh, uh, relatively prudent about uh, steering its uh, monetary policies. Another thing as well uh, is very uh, quite uh, uh, often to see is about the tax incentive or some supporting measures uh, rolled out by the local or provincial governments. Well, uh, reduction of some taxes and fees, especially for the small and medium sized enterprise, uh, some credits, tax credits returns, or some facilitation measures. You can see that well uh, for the official policy side, well, uh, China is uh, uh, very good at uh, implementation of some administrative measures to help the economy, to help the companies. Well, uh, also well, uh, there is also some uh, uh, additional policies uh, from the government to uh, trying to stimulate the domestic demand, especially to stimulate the domestic consumption. For example, in uh, our neighbor Guangdong province, uh, they just recently rolled out some uh, uh, policy measures to encourage the people to consume, to buy more automobiles, household items, uh, to do more to uh, tourism, something like that. Well, uh, after look, uh, taking a look on the economy, uh, let's uh, advance to the uh, uh, China's uh, national strategy or about the digital economy. Well, uh, today for uh, China, well, uh, adopting the digital economy is already a national strategy uh, to foster the uh, fundamentals or the uh, long, long term growth potential of the countries. Well, uh, this year is the 10th anniversary of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, of China. Well, uh, actually, back, in, uh, to, back to 2013, 10 years ago, in this document, it's already mentioned about the digital sale role. Well, this is the external uh, cooperation side of the uh, mainland government, government trying to uh, have a, a closer cooperation with the mainland parties or other countries to enhance the uh, digital uh, cooperation. Well, uh, back to the domestic uh, uh, policy. Well, in its uh, 14 uh, five year plan, uh, it's already talking about the digital development and we will be able to build a digital China uh, 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 in the next 10 years. Well, and in last year, uh, last October, well, uh, it's also, uh, there's also one of the important meetings uh, held by the uh, mainland uh, Communist Party. Well, in this one, well, uh, 
the report say that well, uh, building a modernized industrial system uh, by means of the digital uh, economy or the so-called digitalization is among the key of the uh, uh, future growth of the economy. Well, uh, it's uh, calling about the deeper integration uh, of the digital economy with the real economy. So I think it's very important that well, uh, uh, for China government, it uh, didn't just uh, merely uh, saying something uh, without uh, the actual implication on the uh, real uh, economic sectors. So well, uh, let's uh, take a look at the next slide. Uh, it explained to you well uh, today. Well, uh, the China's economy, uh, half of its uh, of the uh, economy, almost uh, half uh, right now, stay at uh, forty one point five percent of the GDP is already digitalized, right? And uh, the scale of the so called digital economy uh, has been growing in the past uh, few years. It right now uh, account for over forty percent of the GDP. I think well, uh, in uh, later on, well, in the next few years, as uh, China approach, uh, uh, approach the fifty percent levels. Well, uh, one uh, interesting thing is that uh, how China achieved the digital economy is uh, mainly by uh, the so-called uh, 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 industry digitalized. Well, and other in the uh, uh, in, in on the other hand, well, uh, for the digital business, well, uh, they are trying to turn the digital technology into uh, real uh, industries. So combine these two means, well, uh, it's already uh, account uh, for 40% of the GDP of the economy. Uh, next slide, please. And today, well, uh, if uh, we look at the international comparison, uh, China has already uh, uh, stayed at the second, uh, 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 have a second ranking in a global uh, uh, scenario, well, it's uh, uh, after the uh, first one, the US. Well, if you look at the uh, huge population, population and the huge uh, economic size of uh, China, well, when comparing with the US, uh, uh, it's a digital uh, economy just account for around uh, 7.1 uh, trillion US dollar. Well, uh, it's around half or less than half of the US uh, size. So you can imagine that it's uh, still a, a, a room for growth for the China's digital economy. Well, um, in the future, well, uh, China right now is uh, actually focusing on a number of uh, applications, like the application of the digital technology in the agriculture, uh, software development, and the industry. And one of the in interesting uh, uh, area for uh, the ordinary person about the uh, e-commerce, well, especially the digital payment, on the uh, online retail sales. Well, uh, so well today, well, if you uh, go to China uh, with our digital wallet, well, uh, you can still uh, uh, spend the, uh, uh, spend your money uh, with the uh, currency notes. Well, but uh, you will find it a very inconvenient right now in China, right? And another, another focus is about the uh, is mobile communications. So, uh, right now, China's uh, is uh, uh, 5G uh, applications uh, in terms of the base stations uh, installed or the in terms of number of users. Well, China is already uh, uh, account for 60% of the world's total uh, by the end of the last year. So China, for, especially for the mobile communication, this application has uh, uh, um, uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, far, uh, farther and farther. Next slide, please. And one more thing is uh, I would like to share with you is that well, actually, well, uh, in uh, in the world, well, uh, uh, in China, including Hong Kong, uh, uh, China already uh, uh, accommodate two interesting and uh, fantastic uh, science and technology cluster. The one is the Beijing, another one is the Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou, which is located in the Greater Bay Area. So for these two uh, uh, technology clusters, actually the focal development is also on the digital uh, technology, including the microelectronics, uh, software development, and the ICT. So you can see that while uh, uh, in, the, in the world, uh, there's already two uh, fantastic uh, technology clusters located in China, right? And uh, I'm, I'm also happy to see that Hong Kong is uh, also uh, among the cluster. 
And so, well, you can see that well, uh, for the future, well, well, China will, uh, will uh, only accelerate the pace of the digital development uh, uh, technology in order to uh, boost or to boost uh, further the uh, economic fundamentals of the countries. So after uh, having said that, let's uh, go down to the implication to, for the business, right? And actually, well, if you look at such a development, you can uh, imagine that uh, if for the private enterprise, uh, like those in Hong Kong or those in Asia or, or, or everywhere, well, if you, you would like to uh, tap into the mainland market, well, uh, you can uh, actually uh, have a, a lot, uh, have a lot of uh, cooperation opportunities. Uh, well, uh, like uh, you provision of the technical service or technical support uh, uh, to the mainland counterpart in a number of uh, uh, digital technology area like big data analytics, uh, IoT automations, and e-commerce. Well, but when we uh, talk about such opportunities, I would like to remind that we need to pay attention to the regulatory environment in mainland China, uh, especially the cyber security and the data issues. Right. Actually, for even uh, uh, even uh, for Hong Kong companies, well, we are very also very careful about this one. Well, but I can say that actually, uh, uh, in today's China, for many of the regulatory uh, provision, uh, they are uh, if you are familiar with the provision, they are actually not so terrible and uh, are really uh, business friendly uh, to the communities. Well, so if you just uh, follow the the, the uh, measures, then uh, you uh, well, uh, uh, this one should not uh, have uh, uh, become the obstacle to the business. But the most important part is that we need to pay attention to this one, not to uh, cross the red lines. Well, uh, one of the uh, one of the provisions about the size about the security uh, issues. Well, uh, well um, another one is uh, about the personal uh, information. So when we talk about the uh, cyber security and uh, personal data, when we need to be uh, uh, very attentive to such kind of uh, uh, regulatory issues. Okay, apart from the regulations, well, uh, we also need to look at the uh, market. Well, when we talk about the uh, digital China market potential, we need to pinpoint uh, which area, which uh, kind of the business we want to tap into the mainland. Well, uh, one of the example I can give you is about the uh, uh, market in the Greater Bay Area, right? Uh, although China is a huge market, well, uh, for, for individual companies, it's hard for you to uh, tap the market of different provinces at the same time. And uh, for Hong Kong, I relate from the Hong Kong angle, I would like to introduce to you uh, one of the uh, uh, quite energetic market in mainland China. Is about the Greater Bay Area, uh, including Hong Kong and Macau and nine uh, mainland uh, uh, cities in Guangdong province. Uh, the 11 cities already account for over 86 million consumers. And uh, within this uh, one, uh, around 80 million uh, of the clients are actually located in the mainland. And uh, if we want to really take in the market, for example, if we want to tap into the consumer market, well, uh, Digital technology is very, is very important because for the China's consumer market, well, many consumer, I, I can say that the majority, well, uh, are actually uh, have a so-called online and offline mode. Well, uh, for such kind of uh, behavior, it applies to the marketing and also the, for the individual consumers. So when we go for the market, we need to take care about uh, your online uh, promotion or, or online technology to see how to tap the, uh, uh, consumers' uh, 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 consumptions. Well, at the same time, well, uh, the, 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 the consumers up there also like to uh, go to the uh, brick and mortar and the uh, physical shops to, uh, to see how uh, the product or service they consume look like. So, well, uh, even in China, uh, the consumer market uh, has becoming more sophisticated. Uh, in view of the uh, development of the, of the application of more and more digital technology in these uh, areas. And we also have the so-called cross-border e-commerce. Well, uh, another area that the uh, Chinese consumers uh, actually utilize uh, uh, many of the, uh, the uh, online uh, technology and uh, go shopping uh, across the boundary. 
So for 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 uh, companies like uh, Hong Kong or other foreign companies, companies, if we really want to tap the China market, tap the Greater Bay Area market, we need to take care about the digital development uh, in the countries uh, uh, so that we can have uh, uh, some success in the market uh, in our marketing uh, campaign. Well, uh, another uh, survey data I can share with you is that, well, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have a, a, a survey uh, done uh, early this year, and we found that, well, uh, if uh, the companies uh, would like to uh, tap with the domestic market in GBA, uh, the, uh, the Guangdong province, well, uh, they have to do some advertising, uh, some uh, online trade fairs or uh, some physical trade fairs in Hong Kong or in, uh, in mainland China promotion. But if you look at the details, every, everybody say well, they need to go for the online and offline mode. Uh, no matter it's about the advertising, uh, trade fairs or the other publicity promotion. So you can see that well, uh, even the, for the business sector, they are already already aware of the digital development of the uh, of the of this market. And it's very important for them to apply different kind of a digital technology in order to make sure that their business in mainland China can be successful. Well, uh, one more figure I can share with you is that around one uh, a quarter of the retail sales in, in mainland China are actually conducted online. So you can see that well, uh, this figure really uh, very, very amazing. Uh, one fourth of the uh, consumption. Uh, uh, wider uh, online channels. So it's very important for, uh, for foreign companies or even the domestic company who want to take the market uh, 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 to observe such development. And lastly, well, uh, if uh, we really want to uh, get in touch, uh, take the uh, mainland market, well, uh, we maybe may need to uh, find some partners in mainland China. Or, or for the mainland, uh, mainland counterparts, if they really, they really want to cooperate with the, uh, the outsider, well, uh, well uh, they need to have uh, somewhere to go to uh, uh, obtain some services uh, in order to have uh, to facilitate a business deal. Well, uh, I take the money side, the money uh, dollar amount as an example. Well, if the mainland company want to go out to, uh, to, to work with their uh, foreign counterparts, or some foreign company want to do business with mainland China, well, uh, for this this one, no, no matter it's uh, going out or uh, uh, coming in, well, well, uh, if in terms of money, 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 money amount, well, around uh, two thirds of such money is actually channeled through Hong Kong, right? So you can see that well, Hong Kong is really a platform uh, to uh, for a foreign company to do the business with the mainland China. Well, uh, among this one, uh, we also have uh, some uh, recent survey result that. Well, for the mainland companies who want to do business with the outsider, well, uh, over 60% of them want to uh, come to Hong Kong to acquire some service support in order to help them to negotiate with their uh, foreign counterparts or uh, do uh, some uh, transaction or uh, uh, do some financial arrangement. Well, so that, well, uh, uh, so for this one, well, if you look at these figures, uh, I can say that, uh, or I can recommend that, well, if uh, some foreign com companies really want to uh, do uh, business with the mainland companies or tap the mainland markets, well, uh, please consider Hong Kong, which is a really uh, a very effective platform for you to tap into the mainland market. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chu, for dialing in from Hong Kong and for your very informative sharing on how to navigate the post-COVID post uh, recovery. I believe our participants now have a better understanding of how to adapt the business to an ever, uh, evolving digital landscape. Hopefully, we can tap on those opportunities arising from the huge China market, as you mentioned, especially from the, uh, from the greater, greater Bay Area. Now, moving next, please allow me to introduce Ms. Catherine Huang from BPO who will share with us her insights on the fundamental shift that are reshaping the HR practices in the digital age. Catherine, please. Thank you. Thank you, Flora, and thank you, SBF, for the invite, and thank uh, the previous uh, two speakers for your informative speech about these macro-level developments when it comes to China and the world. So for my uh, topic today, I'm going to narrow it a bit down to a more micro-level. 
And I believe that HR industry is actually uh, relevant and important to everyone, to every organization, as we what we say people are core, quote unquote, asset to every organization. So today I'm going to take you through this journey to see what's going on in HR digitalization in China's digital age. So today's agenda would be, first of all, I will make a brief introduction about myself and the company I work for, and then right, go right into the topic of the changing role of people management in the digital age, and then how tech as an enabler can curate the employee experience. And last but not least, I will share some challenges in HR digitalization. So I will give you a very quick introduction of about, uh, about myself. I'm Catherine Huang, working for Bipo in the corporate and global relations team uh, to strategize the company's brand proposition worldwide and also to advise global clients on their entry into China and how to navigate the complexities of the market in compliance with local labor law and regulations. So about our company, actually, uh, we were, next page, yes. Uh, we were established in 2010, and we are an Asia-based global HR technology and service provider. We are headquartered in Singapore. We have three main product and services. One is HR management system, and also global payroll outsourcing services and employer of record services. So as you see from this map, our global footprint, we have, uh, Next page, please. yes, thank you. So we have covered all the countries in the region and also we have offices in Europe, Africa, North America, South America, et cetera. So in all, we want to enable globalizing companies in by providing them with, with one-stop HR solutions. So without further ado, let's come to the main topic of today, the changing role of people management in the digital age. So as you see that digital age is moving at such a fast pace that is fundamentally transforming the way organizations operate, be it in the private or the pri public sector, uh, it's requiring them to develop new operation models, hence the profound effects on the functions of HR departments and their role in identifying new approaches to manage people. Before delving into what's happening in China, as you can see from this page, that I want to first of all talk about what are the disruptive trends from a global perspective. Uh, we've seen a digital a mega digital trends such as cloud, cyber, data, and just this morning I saw from WeChat post that some companies are already using metaverse to do recruitment. So everything is going through this exponential uh, growth when it comes to digital. And also we've seen a, a more and more digitally savvy employees, in the emergence of them. And thus, in the future, we are facing this workforce that is multi-generational. According to a report by the year 2030, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. So how to engage them? It can be an a important issue for all the decision makers, all the uh, HR people, right? And also we are living in this hyper-connected world. We have all these communication tools such as Teams, Zoom, Tense meetings. We have CRM, ERP, HR management system. And uh, when it comes to China, maybe you have used or have heard of WeChat, which is a, I would say, miracle app that everything can be done just within this app. You can do it from food delivery, from car hailing, just all the way to accessing or uh, doing uh, your workman documents. So everything is hyper-connected. Then it, when it comes to managing people, uh, we have also seen this stronger need ever than before that there is a work-life uh, balance needs to be made. So how to balance that when we are all these hyper-connected? So all these have a great impact on the traditional business models and the future of organization. So previously our, our organization mainly uh, lied on the speed, efficiency, and then we've seen that the focus has shifted gradually to speed, adaptability, and agility. And also we used to operate organizations in a more hierarchical model, and now it becomes more team-centric, project-centric, and more transparent. So uh, when it comes to China market, actually, uh, previous page, please. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, next page. Uh, main trends, main HR trends in China. Uh, Yes, we have seen eight trends, eight topics, and HR digitalization is one of them. Uh, and also for all these eight trends, there are some others that are greatly linked back to HR digitalization. For example, working mode. 
We've seen these working from home, flexible working hours that derive from Silicon Valley in the United States and then expanding to the world. And, and in China, it's quite um, interesting that I believe that most of you have heard China speed, Shenzhen speed. You've seen that the, uh, the, the, the focus, the emphasis on the speed side. So when Chinese companies are pursuing the speed and efficiency of business innovation models, sometimes it requires companies to advance tasks from top to bottom in a very centralized space and meet deadlines, right? So under such a development mode, there is uh, some teams need to com communicate more frequently in real time hold meetings, assign tasks, and check progress. So um, if, if someone asks me, if, is it encouraged to have these flexible working hours or working from home mode in China, I would say probably it depends in different industries. For example, it's more likely to be seen in education, media, financial services, consulting services, but even in tech companies, uh, right? We've seen that tech companies encourage this work from home mode during the pandemic. But actually right now I've heard that I've heard that some companies are having these bringing back employees back to workforce campaign. So it can be a, a, a trend in the future, but right now it's still well on the, this outlook. So when it comes to flexible staffing, actually it's also linked back to HR digitalization. Uh, in the future, there's a trend that there are more and more gig workers, freelancers and contractors. Uh, for, for one side, companies want to reduce costs, for other side, especially for younger generation, they want to have this one full-time job to secure their financial stability, but also they want to have a second uh, or part-time job to e explore their interests, to explore their life, but while also in the meanwhile can have a second income, right? So yeah, flexible staffing is also linked back to HR digitalization. I'm not going uh, detail into other trends like employer brand or employee well-being, but, but just focus to uh, to this topic, HR digitalization, which brings us to the next page. So there's a map that you can see from uh, this map, the percentage of respondents rating HR digitalization as important or very important by country and by region. Uh, in the right vertical column, you can see that China ranks the in the middle level when it comes to this uh, the percentage of the importance of this trend. And when it comes to uh, region, Asia actually only comes up to Latin and South America after Africa and ranks the third. So I would say it's still very important uh, for to do this uh, to do this process for lots of companies. So in the next page is about employee experience. Well, this is also map about the percentage of respondents rating this trend important or very important, and you can see that China is ranking at the third place, only after, after Brazil and India. Why I stand out this page particularly, actually is linked back to the next pages I'm going to share with you. Uh, employee, employee experience actually, it's about everything. It's not only about HR digitalization, it's about social, uh, it's about uh, the payroll package, benefits, well-being, workplace culture, right? But still, I would say that it's very highly connected to uh, why companies are doing this HR digitalization journey. So who is taking the lead in China? I categorize it into four parts. Some companies need to manage a large number of employees and urge to improve their management efficiency. In this case, they own companies in China and multinationals. And also some tech companies uh, who already have a digital DNA in their culture are more likely to do so as well. Also, we've seen that some decision makers that have a high level of interest in digitalization are very willing to invest. And also, and also from our own experience, some companies that are expanding rapidly, that are internationalizing rapidly, they are willing to do so as well to manage their global workforce, global teams. So what's the status quo? What's the implementation like in China? As you can see from this pie chart, 70, uh, 33, uh, 37% of companies are on this journey, are planning to digitalize. And 34% of companies have one singular module automated. So what does that mean? For example, if a company in manufacturing industry, uh, for them, clocking and clock out, uh, the arrangement of shifts are a priority for them. They are more willing to automate this part out of all HR modules first to address their needs, right? Uh, we've also seen uh, that 15% of companies have automated multiple modules. For example, onboarding, offboarding, leave management, claims, payroll, right? So in this case, they have gathered um, 
what we call Zhu employee data so that they can generate analysis and that's which is better for their management decisions. Also, we've seen about 7% of companies who have done the complete automation. So in this case, they have all uh, thorough data at hand to generate business intelligence to better in, uh, improve their organization performance in this market. So why are these companies digitalizing HR? Uh, the top three reasons are data analysis, employee experience, as well as to reduce administrative HR work and shift their focus to more strategic level. Well, interestingly enough, in comparison in 2021, which it was two years ago, the primary reasons for companies to go through HR digitalization uh, was first of all, to reduce administrative HR work and then data collection and analysis. And then lastly, it's better uh, is, uh, to enhance employee experience. But just after two years, there is an increase of importance for data analysis and enhancing employee experience, while reducing admin work for HR is no longer the predominant reason. So which has somewhat reflected the change of the mindset. The conventional thought of HR job is, well, in Chinese, what we say, get your head count and payroll correct. But now employee experience, human-centered management, and efficiency driven by data has become more important. And the conception of HR job has shifted from pure administrative support level into strategic management. So in here, the next page, I use our own product interface to showcase what will possibly be the modules. For example, we have onboarding, offboarding, personnel hub, payroll attendance, all the way to claims, which covers the entire life cycle of employees. So in all, we want to use, we want to leverage technology as an enabler to make life easier, both for employees and also for the organization. So what will be the challenges lying ahead? Actually, uh, I have uh, decided divided into two parts. One are external, others are internal. So for in external factors, we have uh, the technology itself has to be compliant with local labor law and regulations, especially when it comes to data, uh, whether, uh, how to ensure the access to clean and reliable database, how to govern data, how to process it, store it, it and uh, transfer it cross-border with, uh, with security, right? We have seen lots of countries, they have their own uh, personal income protection law, the uh, personal information protection law, and also some data transfer protection law. So it's very important to be compliant with these law and regulations. When it comes to internal factors, uh, according to our own experience and observation, and we've uh, spotted uh, several factors. One is that within the organization, there is sometimes lack of digitally savvy talents within the HR department itself. We've also and we've always said that HR people actually are the spokesperson for the uh, for the implementation strategy, right? So they need to be uh, the trailblazer in this journey. And also another concern is how to transfer, how to transition transit from the digital HR to intelligent HR to generate the uh, the right analysis to boost the performance. It can be an issue as well. And for some companies, uh, the digitalization. They are very willing to do so, but it is not done in a very linear or consistent approach. And sometimes for companies, there's a lack of support from management team or there's some internal pushback. For example, it takes time for employees to get used to using these tools or uh, get used to the shifting of one vendor to another uh, to, to, to be able to adapt to these tools. So in all, actually technology, no matter how advanced it is, it's a means to an end. The thorough digitalization it's not only about the change and implementation of tools, but a transformation driven by a powerful tool to, to optimize organizational operation, business models, and corporate culture. So I would say from top-down level, a shared goal and vision, clear strategies needed to within a company to drive through this digital transformation. Well, as the time is quite limited here, so I'm just leaving uh, my, uh, my my some of my uh, well, I'm not seeing this uh, deck presented by SBF, but actually I'm leaving my email address here, maybe in the chat box. Oh uh, yeah, here yes. Uh, I've oh, 
I've already left my QR code here. If you want to carry on this conversation, if you have any inquiries, you can scan uh, the QR code here. Or if you don't have it, you can drop me an email. I'm very willing to assist from there. So thank you, everyone. And let me give the floor back to SBF. Thank you, Catherine, for your sharing, especially on how foreign companies can navigate the complexities of HR management, talent acquisition, and employee engagement in the digital era. This is very helpful. Now, um, we have come to our panel discussion and Q&A session. Uh, besides the three presenters who have already joined us earlier, we also have uh, Mr. Edward uh, Cannon, Corporate Hedging Manager from Covera, to be part of the panel. Before we start the discussion, let's take a quick look at the poll results. And uh, thank you very much for all of you who have contributed to the poll. Much appreciated. So uh, question number one looks like uh, the regulatory uh, hurdles is the most, like the top reason uh, or top challenge that um, our participants think foreign companies might face when entering China's digital economy market. Then for the second one, um, Okay, quite even, but definitely strong uh, local partnerships are the key factors for success for foreign companies in, uh, to participate in China's digital economy. Yeah, followed by, yeah, more, uh, close to 60% uh, chose adapt adaptation to local consumer preferences. Yeah. Okay, question number three. Uh, this one is about Singapore. As a, Singapore, uh, as a global innovation hub, what do you think will be the key driving factors or driving forces for Singapore to continue to grow our digital economy? So strong government support uh, from, yeah, uh, rents as the number one, then followed by, okay, two, uh, dynamic ecosystems of innovation and innovation. Then high quality of infrastructure on innovation and R&D. Okay, yeah. Number four, what are the issues impacting the digital successes in your opinion? I think this one is more on your individual uh, companies or the enterprises uh, digital adoption. So the highest ranking factor is the lack of access to digital talents. Interesting. Um, challenges in up or reskilling existing staff. Okay, and uh, pressure to focus on immediate instead of longer term yeah, benefits. Okay, the last question. What kind of support do you wish to receive to enhance the pace of digital adoption? So again, yeah, government uh, investments, support or uh, test incentives. Then followed by, I think the second one is close to 50% uh, chose the support from the senior stakeholders for innovation. Yeah, and the uh, experimental uh, mentation. Then guidance from the strategic consultants, uh, then as well as the uh, progressive regulatory uh, compliance policies. Interesting. Okay, now um, may I invite the panelists to share your quick comments on the poll results, please? Um, do you think you're, like, you're surprised to see the result or are they quite uh, expected? Do I um do we have all the panelists here? Yes. Catherine, what do you think? I think, I think uh, yeah, I'm, I was just reading through all the tables. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I was just reading through all the questions and one by one I thought um well from my personal, my daily work and also our industry and what we are dealing with clients every day, I think all of them are very legit. When it comes to the question of percentage, yes, I would mostly agree. Yes, fantastic. Yes. And how about Mr. Chu? Do you think like this result actually uh, also like echo uh, those from Hong Kong? I think uh, the most eye catching to me is about the uh, first option in your first option in your first question. Uh, the challenge to enter the uh, digital China market, or I think well, but in general, the challenges to end the China market on the whole, well, 
And the first option that uh, many uh, respondent chose uh, is the regulatory hurdles. Well, I think well, uh, for this one, actually, uh, of course, different countries have different uh, regulatory provisions and you have to follow the rules. But for this one, uh, in Hong Kong, I always receive a lot of inquiry about uh, the regulatory provision uh, in mainland China, even from the Hong Kong companies. Well, uh, to me, uh, well, uh, always, uh, we always find that uh, there's a uh, very uh, uh, big misunderstanding about the uh, regulation uh, in mainland China. Because, well, uh, maybe because of a different kind of uh, uh, the legal system. So uh, for many uh, uh, outsiders, they actually have, a, I think, uh, there's a, a gap about their knowledge of uh, China's uh, regulatory environment. And as I mentioned in my presentation, actually, well, uh, if you understand really uh, uh, what's the uh, boundary, what's the provisions uh, in mainland China, so you may find that uh, indeed, well, uh, in many uh, uh, business, business area, uh, the regulatory environment is not so difficult in mainland China. And uh, if you, you today you say how to uh, set up a company, how to acquire license, well, uh, we also get some uh, in, uh, in-house advice uh, and they always talk to our client that, well, actually for that such an area, there's no more, uh, uh, say the approval or permits you require, you just uh, have a, a normal filing and that's it. But for the inquirer, they always say, well, oh, I don't believe it. No permit required, no approval required. Unbelievable. So I think well, there's a huge gap uh, 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 between uh, 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 or the misunderstanding about uh, what happened in mainland China today. Well, uh, you will talk about the uh, old days, well, uh, it's a totally different story. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. I think now uh, we shall open the Q&A session to the floor. Uh, looks like um, our participants has already raised many interesting questions in the in the past one hour. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I will just group the questions of a similar uh, nature together. So the first question from the floor, uh, I need to buy Chinese RMB every month and I have seen it has weakened significantly over the past few months. Do you think it's a good time to hedge at these levels? Uh, also, isn't it um, hedging a bit like uh, gambling? Uh, interesting question. Perhaps I can invite uh, perhaps uh, Edward to take this question first. Sure. Thank you, Flora. Uh, I might address the second part of that question first. Uh, is hedging a bit like gambling? Because we do come ac across that question more than uh, I would have expected uh, here in Singapore anyway. Uh, in that there is a, a common misperception that hedging uh, is somewhat like gambling or like taking a position, whereas in actual fact, it's the opposite of that. So in saying that, not everyone needs to hedge. We do have customers here in Singapore whereby they can change prices with fluctuations in currency markets. One such example, some customers in the food industry, for example, if they're importing in US dollars and the US dollar appreciates, then although their imports more expensive, they can change prices because all their competitors do as well. So when there's no impact from currency fluctuations, yes, you don't need to hedge, but uh, for most customers who have a pricing cycle or if it's a project-based type of business, then if you don't hedge, it is very much like gambling because you're then just hoping that the currency doesn't move or that it goes in your favor. And ultimately, none of us really know where currency pairs are going to move. There can be very good views. Uh, we have our own views here at Comura that Boris shared earlier. But uh, ultimately, we don't know where the pair is going to go. If, we, if I did know where it was going to go, I probably wouldn't need to be uh, here on the panel today. So in terms of uh, is it a good time to hedge, if we look at the Remimbi itself, it has weakened significantly. We saw that in the earlier presentations. Uh, against the US dollar since January, the Remimbi's weakened uh, almost 10%. Even against the Singapore dollar, that's a less volatile pair, uh, it's weakened around 5% since January. So it's somewhat of a gift for buyers of Remimbi that when you've had a move in your favor of that magnitude, it's always worthwhile hedging. And in saying that, uh, we never think it's a bad time to hedge. So. Uh, typically, we would say uh, hedge a portion of your requirement, 50 to 75%. Then you've taken some risk off the table. And if the pair keeps moving in your favor, 
then you need to uh, obviously buy more. But definitely, given that the move that we've had uh, for buyers of Remimbi at current levels, it would be prudent to consider locking in some of the benefit that uh, has now arisen since the start of the year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu, just now you also mentioned about like the, the some currency uh, outlook. Do you agree with Edward or do, would you like to add some points? I think well, uh, uh, on the whole, well, uh, I agree with uh, Edward's comment. And uh, I would like to add one more thing is that now, uh, when we uh, talk about the strain for or, or the exchange rate of RMB, actually I think it's a question of the US dollar rather than RMB well, because well, uh, the, the, today, well, the US dollar is very strong, right? Uh, no matter you look at the euro or the RMB. So, so I think well, uh, I'd rather put more focus on the US dollar rather than the RMB, indeed. Understand. Um, one question from David Lai. Uh, will offshore RMB sustain? Edward or Boris, would you like to take this question? Well, I don't know how to interpret the question, to be honest, but um, if we're talking about the differences between the onshore and the offshore, um, yes, because if you look at, for example, the importance of offshore uh, remedy for the whole world, especially for, for example, my region in, in, in Europe, where hedging of the Chinese renminbi is getting more and more important over the years, um, or in general, if we just look at um, Chinese assets that are being bought by foreigners. This is definitely something that we are seeing to continue in the next couple of years. If you look at bonds denominated in um, the renminbi that are getting issued by non-Chinese um, uh, uh, corporates and um, companies, it has actually hit the all-time high in 2023. So this is definitely something because I've been talking about in my presentation about the Chinese renminbi being a low yielder which is at first glance a negative for a currency. But the second thing that is good for the Chinese renminbi is that given that the yield is currently the lowest in kind of the G10 space and compared to other currencies, some companies have benefited from them and they've started um, issuing bonds in the Chinese renminbi because they are paying a lower interest rate on these bonds than if they would issue the bond in, for example, the US dollar or the euro where they would have to pay five, six, seven percent on their bonds. So this is why one, if I would just add to one of the forecasts for 2024 and beyond, is that the issuance in of bonds of non-Chinese um, companies in the Chinese renminbi will be definitely something to watch in the next couple of years. And this is one reason why the PBOC, the um, People's Bank of China, is actually push, pushing this development because it means that the Chinese renminbi will gain in global importance, uh, right? And will be something that they would like to rival the euro or the USD. So this is something to watch for the next couple of years. Thank you. I think you also like uh, answer some, uh, like some of those questions like, um... Uh, what is the best product if I want to hedge my requirement to buy a uh, USD and then uh, will USD appreciation cost or be even higher against the APEC currencies? Uh, any Anything to add on? So in terms of uh, hedging US dollars, uh, as we're abundantly aware, the US dollars uh, had a period of uh, resound strength even over the past couple of months, let alone uh, for this year alone. When currencies are, are trading at their yearly highs, like against just about every currency at the moment, the US dollar is at its highest uh, level or, or close to for 2023 uh, so far. Uh, and in this type of scenario, uh, it may impact what type of uh, product a customer may choose to hedge. So our, our US dollar buyers at the moment, uh, whilst some are considering a forward contract, which just locks in a rate close to current market, there's other solutions available for hedging whereby you can still have protection in case the US dollar does move higher. If we look at the US dollar against the Singapore dollar, for example, currently trading around 1.37. Now, whilst, uh, as uh, Boris outlined earlier, our forecasts here at Convira are for the US dollar to weaken into next year. Uh, but that doesn't mean it can't go higher in the meantime. Maybe it will trade up to 1.4. We don't know. So to protect against that type of uncertainty, there's solutions whereby 
customers can have protection, for example, at 1.38, but perhaps participate down to 1.35 if we do see some weakness in the US dollar. So rather than locking in a forward contract, which a customer may have utilized when the dollar sing was down at 1.33, they may be looking at a different type of solution that can allow for some uh, participation. But ultimately, it all depends on customer preferences. We do have customers that are just concerned about exchange rates moving against them, in which case they'll still prefer something like a forward contract that provides guaranteed protection. Uh, but then we also have other customers who are all, always trying to achieve better rates than current market. But with better rates than market, there's additional risks attached and you may not end up with protection. So ultimately, it comes back to a customer's goals uh, about hedging. Um, there's no no right or wrong. It's all about uh, what your preferences are uh, at the time. Very good point, yeah. Just to add one last thing. It is almost impossible to forecast the top of any currency, even though we're expecting the US dollar to weaken as a broad narrative for 2024. Um, we or most of investment banks um, are also forecasting oil prices to fall and interest rates to fall. And even though everyone is forecasting this for 2024, in the last couple of weeks, we have seen US interest rates rise to the highest level in 15 years. We have seen oil prices rise beyond the $95 per bar barrel level and the US dollar appreciate again, because we are currently in a very uncertain environment where basically the whole economy hopes that the Federal Reserve won't have to raise interest rates any further. And if they have to do, then obviously our narrative will get postponed from Q4 this year to maybe Q1 or Q2 next year. So um, forecasting the top is always almost an uh, impossible task, but this is why we have to, again, um, try to be very flexible in our hedging positions, uh, like Edward mentioned, and then again, start going from the short to the medium term forecasting. That, that is important for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Boris and Edward, for sharing this. Uh, and again, I would like to uh, remind all the participants that all uh, what we discuss here um, is just for information sharing. It does not form any kind of like a investment advisory or like a um, like a financial advisory. Okay. Uh, now, from the list of questions, I'm seeing a few questions uh, related to the HR uh, HR solutions. How does HR digitalization serve as an enabler to support the companies uh, when they enter into the China market? That's uh, the first one. And then which aspect, uh, from Mr. Ng or Mrs. Ng, uh, which aspects do HR do uh, companies in China want to digitalize first, in your opinion? Okay, Can thank we... you for, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, I answer the first one first. Uh, when it comes to market entry, this is the most tricky stage of a, com uh, a company. For example, when companies grow into large scale or even SMEs, it's more legit to, for them to do the HR digitalization. So for companies that are at the stage of market entry, it can be tricky. For example, for some companies, they just want to test waters. They want to feel the environment. So at the, that stage is not, um, I would say, you should have a clear purpose to do the HR digitalization. But we do see that for uh, from our own observation, for our own uh, clients, we've seen some companies when they're entering, uh, they are after the pre-entry, right after the pre-entry period, they are willing to do that because they may have encountered some um, payroll or some labor law compliance and tax compliance issue. Because as we know that China, uh, uh, when it comes to every market, Compliance is the predominant reason, predominant issue. And also in China, tax, tax system, as well as the labor law system is quite stringent and very complex. It, uh, sometimes it changes uh, without, uh, well, it's hard to trace back the, um, the policy. So when some companies have this tool at hand, at actually everything uh, is somewhat integrated into this platform. For example, tax, it can be calculated through a certain type of algorithms when a certain policy comes out. So it means to reduce uh, human errors for uh, in tax and payroll. So it depends on company, um, be it in the entry stage or what are the clear goal to do the digitalization at its current stage. And so the second question is, um, let me... Uh, which aspects to digitalize first for Chinese companies? Okay, it's, um, 
it may vary a lot. For example, I during my presentation, I cited a client that is in manufacturing industry. For them, the clocking, clock out, and the shift uh, for the workers uh, is quite important. The primary reason for them to automate. And for some companies, like I said, payroll to get the because they have cross border uh, management team, cross border team. So for them to get the payroll right and compliantly with the local labor law is their primary concern. So they are trying to do that at the first hand. But for some companies, actually a lot of companies in China, they are doing recruitment at the first stage to do to digitalize this part. So it can um, vary according to the needs of the companies. They can do it singularly or multiply at the same time. Yeah, I hope that answered the two questions. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, one question about the GBA. Uh, in terms of market potential, how does the Greater Bay Area compare to Shanghai and the Yangtze River Delta? Uh, perhaps this one I can invite Mr. Chu to, to take. I think it uh, depends on uh, uh, the company's individual uh, market strategy. So, uh, both GBA and the, uh, the so-called YLDs are the uh, more, most energetic uh, engines of the China economies. Well, uh, if you 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 want to uh, really focus on the uh, trading aspects, well, uh, GBA will be the uh, more uh, one of the uh, ideal uh, places for uh, companies to tap into because uh, it is one of the most important uh, foreign trade cooperation uh, uh, places in mainland China. Uh, but if you look at the domestic market, what uh, saying, well, you want to promote your branded products, well, uh, build your brand, uh, build your marketing channel, maybe uh, uh, Shanghai or uh, the cities nearby is, uh, are more ideal uh, as an entry point for the foreign companies to take into the mainland markets. So I think both of the regions are very important uh, to the mainland economy. And uh, if uh, individual companies uh, uh, have uh, uh, their own strategy, so uh, I recommend that they need to uh, look at the uh, two, uh, place, uh, two places and then uh, adapt to their individual uh, marketing or entry strategies. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, I think um, even though I would love to carry on the discussions, it looks like we are overrunning the program a little bit. So perhaps we will have to end the, uh, today's uh, webinar uh, for now. Um, but yeah, on behalf, uh, th thank you very much uh, for all the uh, panelists for joining the discussion today. Yeah, on behalf of SBF, I would like to once again thank all the speakers for your time and invaluable sharing. But before we end the session, I just want to throw one last question, which is from the floor. Um, maybe I can invite all of you uh, just to uh, share with us. What are the strategies you would recommend uh, for the companies, especially foreign companies, uh, when they assess the uh, potential of China's digital economy or like the digital market? Just perhaps a quick one uh, from your pers your own perspective. Last question, I mean, uh, perhaps uh, Boris first, as our first speaker. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I can only talk to the market side of things. But um, as we mentioned a couple of times, again, the APEC region is getting more important by the decade. And this is something especially because we have seen weak economic growth in Europe and the uh, gravitational pull of economic strength is shifting from the West and the East. So in my opinion, especially the digital part of the economy, as Mr. Chu has been mentioning, is pretty much one of the most important parts to establish this, um, I would say, importance of the region in terms of its participation of the global economy. So this is why we could talk about which sectors have to be digitalized and which uh, way it doesn't make too much sense. But in terms of speaking generally, how to ensure that Asia will continue to be a global growth uh, contributor to kind of the global economy, digitalization will definitely play a big part. And we're also doing, again, um, hedging is one part of it, what we do, but we also help companies in other sectors. And most of them have to do with, you know, how to be digital as well. And we have some programs about green hedging, for example, which is gaining importance. So this is something that will definitely not go away in the in the next decade to come. Thank you. Uh, Edward? 
Sure. Uh, I guess I'd just like to add, uh, in, in terms of our customer experience here with uh, with China, we've had customers that are obviously expanding into China in various industries. Uh, also, on the flip side, we've had some customers had to pull out for various reasons. Uh, one such example has been uh, customers with supplies based in Australia with tensions between China and Australia over the past few years, although they're easing somewhat now. For a long time, uh, they had to cease operating in China because there was just, uh, in short, a, a refusal to to deal with uh, particular suppliers. So, uh, but uh, by and large, uh, what we've learned from customers in terms of uh, having operations or suppliers or customers in China, uh, and this came up in the poll that one of the most important uh, aspects of dealing in China is having partnerships on the ground there. So whether it's the digital industry or, or any other industry, what we've learned from our own customers is that having those strong partnerships in China uh, have made it imperative in terms of having a successful uh, and long-term uh, business relationships there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chu? Uh, I think well for uh, the digital uh, economy opportunities, uh, apart from some uh, technical uh, uh, service or deals, uh, uh, for uh, uh, for the uh, foreign companies in general, well, uh, I think well uh, the first of uh, uh, means that they would like to encounter is about the e-commerce. Well, if you want to uh, get in touch with uh, your mainland uh, mainland China counterparts, well, uh, they always like to use uh, uh, the e-commerce means to communicate with you, to do business with you, or to uh, set up some uh, systematic uh, uh, communications with you. And then uh, for, even for the trading or marketing or uh, some uh, uh, supply chain management. Well, e-commerce are, are very important uh, in uh, different kind of applications or business uh, areas. So I think, well, uh, uh, apart from the technical banks, well, we are really the technical companies. Apart from this one, well, uh, e-commerce will be another important area uh, for foreign companies when you when we are talking about the, uh, how to take the mainland digital economy market thank you so it's uh like your answer is uh tap on the e-commerce development yeah. thank you and uh yeah catherine yeah uh, when it comes to hr digitalization uh, there are a lot um when in china as china i would say uh, as i'm based in shanghai and uh, we serve clients in all industries i would say it's quite complex issue and so when it comes to hr it's not actually it's not bd department it's not that the bringing money and when it comes to digitalization it's costing 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 so that's one of the obstacles for lots of companies so i would say uh, there's a lot lots of things to consider for example industries for example tech in industry versus other industry and uh, when it comes to workforce younger generation as in the workforce or other generations so it a lot a lot of factors to consider but i would interpret in the other way around so what to avoid uh, one mindset to avoid is that i'm doing it because others are doing it so that's that's what I would suggest. That's uh, if we want to put it in one word, that would be my answer. Yeah. Sorry, Flora cannot hear you clearly. We're somehow cannot hear you clearly. I'm not sure it's my side or um yeah. yeah. Ah okay. That's clear now. Okay. So uh yeah thank you uh thank you everyone uh thank you Mr. Chu, uh Boris, Edward and Catherine for your wonderful sharing. For me I personally learned a lot from you in the uh from the past one hour and a half and I believe and I hope our participants can walk away with some very useful information as well. Uh lastly to all the attendees joining us today Thank you very much for coming up with such a wonderful list of questions. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's China Economy Outlook webinar. And uh, lastly, appreciate uh, if you could spend just one to two minutes filling up the feedback form after the webinar. This will, this will help us improve our event management and content development for the upcoming editions. Once again, thank you, everyone. See you in our future events very soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.